If you've ever wondered why your cat keeps doing that thing, you know, that thing I'm talking about, then Online Behavior Day might be the conference for you. Join us for in-depth discussions and FAQs with expert consultants Pam Johnson-Bennett, Tabitha Kusera, and Dr. Rachel Geller, and Arden Moore on Saturday, April 9th. Visit communitycatspodcast.com to learn more and register today. You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we're speaking with Amy Davila Sanchez. As the marketing manager for strategic initiatives at Best Friends, Amy Davila Sanchez focuses on gathering insights and building strategies and activation plans that support life-saving for critical populations like community cats and kittens. Her passion for animals started at a young age while living in Puerto Rico. Her family home was known to neighbors as the house that would take in homeless pets, spay or neuter them, and find homes for them through informal networks of friends and families. She learned to bottle feed kittens before she learned to ride a bike. And before there was YouTube, Amy lives with her partner, Spencer, two rescued dachshunds, guacamole and Madden, and two rescued cats, Filiberto and Oso, and spend their time between Florida and Utah. When not building strategies to save animals, Amy loves to travel, cook, and hike. Amy, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you, Stacey. It's it's a pleasure to be here. So before we dive into the work that you do at Best Friends, you referenced growing up in Puerto Rico. How did you become so passionate about cats? Were you passionate about animals in general? But, you know, what made cats so special to you? So... I definitely am passionate about dogs and cats, but I have a very special bond and connection to cats. Even before I was born, there's pictures of my mom with me in her belly and my first cat, Copito, a beautiful white cat, just um, laying in her belly and, and kind of like taking her through all of her pregnancy. When I was born, Copito was almost like my nanny. <laughs> he was my first best friend, um, my first feline friend. And so I've always, I always grew up with cats. Like you mentioned in my bio, our love for cats meant that the neighborhood knew that we were the family that would take care of cats and find them homes. My mom operated a community cat program before I even knew what a community cat program was. And so I was just raised with a family and with parents that were very much about loving animals and wanting to do well by them, but specifically had a great love for cats. And so I inherited that. So you talk about the support and your knowledge when you were growing up with community cats. One thing that I have felt, I I got involved with doing Trap New to Return back in 1994. So I felt like that was always my go-to option rather than in some situations, some folks would say you would trap and euthanize cats. And I never thought of that as an option. You know, did you ever think of euthanasia as an option for community cats or were you raised in an environment where you just felt that TNR was the way to go. I was raised in an environment where TNVR, um, trap, neuter, vaccinate, return was the option. So unless a cat was, you know, in a, in a bad state of health, we would always find a way to take it to the local vet and, and make sure that we could spay neuter them. We, you know, my, my family was very clear and I, I knew from a very young age that really spay neutering cats was the best alternative, the most humane alternative. And that that's what we could do best by them and for them. That's great. I love hearing that, to be honest, because I feel like sometimes people don't think of, uh, and as you say, TNVR as the first option. As you started to get involved with Best Friends Animal Society, what are the support programs I, I know many of our listeners already know about best friends, but you know, maybe just in a, in a nutshell, give me those like the crib notes version 
of what sort of supportive programs and options, you know, best friends feels are out there for community cats. Totally. So we are best friends is a national um, organization and we have different paths for life saving. Obviously we host uh, different brick and mortar adoption and foster locations across the country, but then we also provide resources for shelters and rescue organizations that want to support cats, things like mentorship programs, community cat program support. Um, our staff has people that can go, staff that can go to different locations to kind of mentor, teach, coach, support different shelters and rescue organizations in their intent for saving as many cats as possible and for implementing and learning how to implement a, a community cat program. We also offer different types of resources, toolkits, educational materials, grassroots resources that can help community shelters really bring people along in the life saving of cats and dogs, uh, but specifically community cats, because we know that community cats are probably um, some of the most or the most at risk population that shelters encounter today. So I'm going to ask you a, a pretty loaded question because you are sitting at the national level. So you get to see what's going on pretty much all across the country. And, you know, at this current time, this snapshot, you know, what do you think are the greatest challenges facing our community cat caretakers, you know, as well as the small grassroots organizations that are out there doing TNVR? I feel like everybody is very overwhelmed mm. um, at the time. You know, there's, there's a lot of cats out there. There's limited resources and there's still, you know, some misinformation or, or not a clear understanding from community members as to the fact that, you know, cats are the most at population as to the, you know, what role they play, what role they can play to help support cats. So, so it's really about expanding the amount of resources that we can give to these CCP caretakers, to these you know, volunteers and people that day in and day out go out to the field to help these cats. And some of those resources can just be by community members learning and raising their hands and kind of joining in to support the cat so that more people can be involved in saving cats' lives. Right now, we can't do it with just the amount of folks that are committed to the cause and to the movement. We need to bring more people in. We need to create the level of awareness and, and create that sense of urgency within different towns, cities, suburbs, for people to know that there's actually something that they can do uh, to help cats. Are there certain parts of the country that you would feel are more community cat friendly than other parts of the country? Um, so I lived in New York City. That was actually my first job with Best Friends was in the New York City operation. And I feel like in New York, you have the concept of bodega cat. So it was completely normal to walk into a convenience store and just see a cat hanging out mm -hmm. in its front door or sleeping on top of a loaf of bread. It was common to see cats in the, the alley of your building. And I feel like people in the city coexisted with the cats. Like there was this understanding that cats were part of the tapestry of the city. And so most people were supportive of it, so much so that there's, you know, an Instagram page dedicated to Bodega Cats that has <laughs> millions of followers. So I would say in my experience and having lived there, New York is probably one of the <laughs> cat friendliest places um, that I have encountered. And are there areas of the country where it's more challenging for community cats? There have been some parts where there's just, no, or very limited access to even spay or neuter resources, even, you know, private practices. I know that Best Friends does a lot of data collecting and, and information collecting, 
And I didn't know if you uh, had seen any any sort of specific trends in areas, you know, where there are those shortages, and maybe there are other challenges at play too in in those regions. And you know, there have been conversations sort of about the north and the south and southern parts of the United States. You know, maybe that's more challenging for community cats on a population standpoint. I mean, the, the climate is better, but maybe there are some more challenges on the on the population side of things. I, I don't know uh, what your thoughts might be on that. Yeah, so the data tells us that there's three states that are right now the top states where cats are dying in shelters. And we know that proportionally a lot of those cats can be community cats. Those three states are... Texas, California, and North Carolina. Some of the challenges that those states face are, as you well mentioned, access to care. You know, actually post-pandemic, we've seen access to care, veterinary care, spay-neuter services. That has become a challenge and is, is you know, one, right now one of the barriers in getting us get as a country to, to no-kill that we can save as many cats as possible. But then also in the specific case of California and Texas, there's where there's a lot of people, there's huge population sizes, there's a lot of cats as well. So the population size also impacts the amount of cats that need to be saved. So a lot of the work that my team is doing, that I'm doing, is really focused on those three states, California, Texas, and North Carolina and using a very like strategic to making sure that we can, from a marketing perspective, focus on specific communities within those three states. So we know within those states, which are the counties, the towns that have um, the biggest needs. And so making sure that we support those communities through marketing education, educational materials through, you know, like I mentioned earlier, inspiring them to make a difference, because this is about community involvement, and then figuring ways in which we can solve for the challenge that is access to care, access to veterinary care and and spay-neuter resources. We interrupt this podcast for a quick trivia question. Where's the single place with answers to all of your animal welfare questions? Yes, even the one that kept you awake until two in the morning. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? It's Maddie's Pet Forum. Maddie's Pet Forum is the only dedicated forum for our industry where you can find answers from colleagues fast and free. Stop doom scrolling and join today. Visit forum.maddiesfund.org slash cats. Could your animal welfare organization use a tune-up? Humane Network can help. You can get a free 30-minute consultation to talk through your challenges and get ideas on how your organization can be more successful with less stress. From board development and fundraising to strategic planning and operations, Humane Network has got you covered. Whether you're a large or small, nonprofit or government, it's a live and thriving program led by a certified animal behavior consultant features specially designed training for shelter and clinic staff on enrichment, stress reduction, safe animal handling, and behavior modification. With Humane Network, you receive individualized advice and support customized to meet your organization's unique needs. And Humane Network can lighten your load by taking on fundraising, communications, and other tasks you struggle with. Contact Humane Network today for a free 30-minute consultation. Visit humanenetwork.org. That's humanenetwork.org. If you're running a rescue, you're probably overloaded with tons of tasks pulling you in even more directions dog and cat intakes, volunteers to communicate with, fosters to find and pass info to, and don't forget about managing the all-important donations. It's easy to become overwhelmed, miss critical information, and worst of all, lose volunteers. Buzz to the Rescues offers an integrative platform that can help you gain back your time, streamline your workload, and clearly communicate with everyone on your team. Learn more at www.rescueyourrescue.com and gain back your peace of mind today. One other question that I, you know, we've talked about the impacts on shelters, but there are, you know, in, in North Carolina, Texas, I mean, there, there are rural areas that may not even have a shelter or a very large shelter environment, but yet there is 
a tremendous need to, you know, assist and support uh, community cats in those areas. And I, I, I get the sense that Best Friends still is committed to assisting and, and helping those cats too, even if they might not be, you know, a statistical number in the database, because you're saying it's community involvement, it's getting more individuals involved. Therefore, in your opinion, are there differences between sort of the urban community cat versus a rural community cat? I think there is a pretty big similarity across the board between urban, suburban, rural community members and community cats. And that is, we recently completed a study that kind of went into understanding community members' perceptions towards community cats, how they felt about them, what they do, what actions they take if they see them. And the biggest learning that we got from that study is that people really love cat, no matter where they are in the country, no matter what type of environment, rural, urban, suburban they live in, they want to do well by cats which leads folks to the action of wanting to take them to the shelter so that they can find a family, so that they can be adopted. And that's awesome that they have these like really positive, heartfelt feelings towards cats. But unfortunately, what happens is, you know, if cats are taken to the shelter, shelters are overwhelmed. They may not have the capacity to handle all the intake that comes to them. Or like you mentioned, some rural areas may not even have shelter. Their shelters may be very small. But I think it is really about making sure that no matter where someone is from, where they live, if they're in a big city, if they're in a rural town, they understand that cats can live perfectly healthy, balanced lives outside as long as they are spayed and neutered and they can't continue to to reproduce. In the study that we did, we did interview rural and urban community members and there really wasn't a big gap with regards to their relationship to community cats, their perceptions on community cats. They just wanted the cats to be okay. <laughs> That's right, that right. was the biggest learning and the biggest takeaway from the study. You mentioned earlier, you were talking a little bit about uh, supporting either small grassroots organizations or organizations in general, potentially maybe even individuals, you know, with various marketing materials. It's part of that. It seems like it's part of the, the mentorship and support. And there is also a program called the Best Friends Network. But if it, I know we're a podcast, so we don't have the visual component, but we'll make sure we get the information in the show notes, you know, links to any of the various examples of materials that you may use in the public to help with educating the public with regards to community cats. I mean, is that that's something that Best Friends really wants to share with people to use information about uh, community cats. So maybe, you know, do your best efforts to sort of just describe some of those marketing materials. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we learned through the gathering was that even though like you and I, we are in the animal welfare space, we are in the community cat space. We talk about these topics day in, day out. Your average community member has very, very little and low awareness as to, you know, what community cat is. Um, what challenges they face, what TNVR, trap, neuter, vaccinate, return means, what ear tipping means. So one of the things that we we wanted to fix and we want to make sure that marketing, we communicate very basic educational points around community cats, around trap, neuter, vaccinate, return, around ear tipping. Explain to folks, hey, what do you do if you see a cat in your community, what steps should you take? So we've created videos, we've created just educational flyers, printed materials that speaks to that. What do you do if you find a kitten in your in your neighborhood? And, and kind of in a very simplified way, without using a lot of jargon, without using a lot of um, more of like convoluted lexicon that we would use in animal welfare, explain to folks the simple actions that they can take to help cats. The biggest one being if you see a cat in your community 
and it has been spayed and neutered, it has an ear tip, or you know that there's a caretaker that cares for it that confirms that the cat has been fixed, just let it be. Just just let it live in your community. Let it be a part of your community. Don't take it to the shelter. So, so that's a little bit of, of what we have done and what we will continue doing is just making sure that the content that we put out, be it video, be it social media posts, be it flyers, door hangers, it's basic and it's very simple to understand actions that folks can take to help cats. So if you are running a a grassroots organization or even just a, a community group, say, you know, five people in your community and you wanted to spread the word about TMVR, is the best thing to go hanging up flyers or door hangers? I mean, are there some best practices? Because there's a, there's a lot of labor involved in all of that community outreach. So what are the things that you get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of getting the word out about being able to help community cats? You know, I think community cats have the word community in it. So it's, I think the number one most effective tool that can be deployed in terms of educating people and bringing them along in our intent to help cats is word of mouth. It's actually meeting people be it, you know, knocking on doors or maybe going to like a community festival where you know that a lot of folks within the community are going to be present and just engaging in conversation, asking questions, supplying facts, data, tips. That is really the most uh, persuasive and the most impactful way to make a difference, right? Social media, digital marketing, they're great tools. They allow us to, you know, reach broad amounts of audience, but it's also a very cluttered and impersonal medium. So if you are a small grassroots organization, just make sure that you are deploying tactics where you are face-to-face with the community, where you get an opportunity to talk to them, where you get an opportunity to listen to them as well, right? Because it's, I think part of marketing is definitely educating folks and, and kind of storytelling and bringing folks along in our journey, but it's also listening to them, learning to them to understand what types of messaging, what types of, of content, what type of things we can put into play to really be as effective as possible. And I think that's critical for for cats, because it's cats. The other thing I will say, cats is a topic that people love. <laughs> people love cats. The majority of people love cats. And so if you talk to folks about cats and say, hey, I want to talk to you about cats, probably a barrier will come down and people are like, sure, about cats. Um, because cats tend to be, you know, an animal that people, people like, people relish. So make sure to go to the field and talk to folks. That would be my number one advice. Can you uh, just share a little bit about what the Best Friends Network is? Yeah, so we have a, uh, it's basically a collective or a, a gathering of shelters, rescue organization, animal welfare organizations all over the country that sign up to become best friends members, right? And it's completely free. There's no cost involved. So it's a, it's a resource that is complementary to any organization that is within the animal welfare space. And when organizations become members, they have access to resources, information, town halls. They have access to grants. Um, we offer grant making opportunities throughout the year and so grant making is one of the the critical aspects um they also have access to promotions and initiatives that we put together to help in life saving so members just have access to different resources that can help in their marketing efforts in their community outreach efforts or in just their their operational so it's a great, great resource for anybody that's right now, either a rescue organization or a shelter, if you're not a best friends 
network partner, I highly recommend that you join because it really, there's no cost associated and lots of benefits that come with it. Amy, if folks are interested in finding out more about Best Friends Animal Society and or the network, you know, how would they do that? Yes, they can visit bestfriends.org. That is our main page. And then we also have a page that's specific to information on community cats. That's bestfriends.org slash community cats. And then also within our website, you can find the link to our network partner um, sign up page, which is where organizations can go to learn more about um, the network partner program and sign up um, if they're not actively a member. Um, so has a section for resources, um, which includes lots of articles and informational educational materials on all topics related to animal welfare, but there's a lot of content in there for community cats as well. People can also follow us on Facebook, Best Friends Animal Society, or on Instagram, Best Friends Animal Society, or BFAS. So there's definitely several ways that you can follow us. And you also have a conference, usually in the summertime. Correct. Yes, we are extremely excited that we are back to (laughs) in-person conferences in 2022. We are going to host next year's conference in uh, Raleigh, Durham. And the dates are uh, during the second week of July. I believe it's July 7th, 9th. Excellent. Well, Amy, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show, and I hope we'll have you back on the show in the future. Perfect. Thank you, Stacey. I look forward to it. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think, and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Thank you.